Hi everyone, um, some of you will know me, some of you won't, so my name is Zoe Chan, I've been at the Trust for about four and a half years now. Um, I currently work in the projects team, so I undertake conservation projects myself, um, but actually I'm also, um, just as an aside, looking at all of our project management internally and how we run and manage um, conservation projects um, going forward and how we decide what we do focus on and what we don't, etc. aligned to strategy. However, um, more excitingly, uh, let's talk about No Mo May and go on to presentation format. Please give me the thumbs up so it looks like everyone can see. What is Nomo May? As most of you will know, um, I think Plant Life set this up in um, about 2019, actually. I'm not sure if they did it the year before. Um, and it was really looking at individuals such as ourselves who um, have our own gardens, for example, um, potentially not mowing either your, your full lawn or areas within it. Um, they also um, are engaging with councils and other landowners as well to see where it's feasible for this kind of activity to be undertaken. Um, and I feel like it really took off last year during lockdown in particular, because most of us were around, you know, I'd been furloughed actually. Um, so I was on furlough from um, April to October actually. Um, so people had more time to afford to things like this and actually look into what, what might be achievable within their own space. So lots of people, including members of my own family, have gone, well, it's just a gimmick, right? Like, no, may, may, like, what, what does it possibly really do? And I started looking into sort of facts and figures with respect to wildlife and in particular pollinators and meadows, et cetera, and came up with the concept of the good, the bad and the ugly. So... If you think about it conceptually, one acre of wild flowers can contain about three million flowers, which is absolutely massive. Um, and you think about any chalk grassland that you've walked through um, around here, you can kind of see that with your own eyes. So that equates to about 96,000 honeybees a day. And that's just the bees and not the rest of the pollinators. But the bad side of the story is that on the whole, we've lost about 7.5 million hectares of meadows nationally, obviously not in Surrey, um, since the 1930s. And, you know, that is attributed to just generic change of land use. Um, a lot of land has been put over to agriculture. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of differences. There's much more amenity land required, um, public access, et cetera, et cetera. But just one percent of our countryside provides a nature rich habitat. So, you know, you can see you can see how those figures start to stack up. And when you start looking into things to do with pollinators and I mean that kind of these kind of figures are all over the place at the moment. About a third of British bees and well, I suppose to say hoverflies, so apologies for that, um, are in decline. Um, and we can see those messages coming through from bug life and all sorts of other organisations um, across the board. And for every square kilometre, we've lost about 11 species of bee and hoverfly, which are irrecoverable. They, they, won't, they won't be coming back. So all these activities add up. These are things that happen in our everyday lives. We can see road verge cutting here. We can see our own mowing. We can see spraying, which um, quite often happens in urban areas. Um, and we can see amenity mowing here on our green spaces. Now, it's not to say that all these activities should stop per se, um, but you can see the grass and the grounds that they're working on are just green grass that are not, that do not contain any kind of um, flowers. So our gardens, it's become clear, have become key. 12% of Surrey is made up of gardens, and that is absolutely huge. And we're in control of what we do within those. We don't have to speak to people to get them to change things. We can make our own decisions as to what works for us. It's clear, and I'll come on to this a bit later, that No Mo May does make a difference as it gives um, the chance for flowers to grow that normally would be mown down, which in return um, draws in the pollinators. It's a, it's a simple equation, really. 
So you can imagine if we all did bits in our garden here, what a difference this would make. And you start to see the county greening up and becoming more connected. And in return, you will get bees. You'll get butterflies. This is a brimstone butterfly here. And moths. Everyone forgets about moths. This is a cinnabar moth um, that you can see often on a uh, ragwort. Somebody sent me this meme and I was thinking twice about whether or not I should put it in, but I just found it hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's American, so uh, uh, excuse the terminology around yard, um, but basically it's saying that we need to think differently about the way that we manage our spaces. Um, you know, historically, we do do a lot of mowing. Uh, certainly in the UK, um, there is a keenness to have neatly manicured lawns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but that's not not always going to give us what we need. Lawns make a huge difference, so as a habitat within their own right. So changing your mowing regime can create enough nectar for about 10 times more pollinators. And that's just within our own space. So imagine if you made a change in your own lawn, but then your neighbour did as well. And then the next door neighbour did and suddenly your street was different. And I've also seen, I was looking at the Plant Life uh, website the other day and there's talking, there's talk of let it bloom June and knee high July. And there was something else for August, but I can't remember quite what that one was. You don't have to not mow at all. So for some people, that's not going to be sensible or feasible. There might be all sorts of reasons for that. Um, so once every four weeks is proven to be pretty effective. It just leaves some longer areas for plants to come through, um, just gives them a bit of a chance before they're, they're cut off at the knees. And really we can just do what we want. It's not about um, having to follow a set rule here. This is a lovely picture which somebody sent me of um, an area that's clearly been worked on for a, for a long time. Um, but I like the concept of um, a mown pathway through this, which I think kind of indicates that you are managing it. Because sometimes there's this perception that if you're not mowing, everything's untidy and unkempt and you don't care about your space if people don't understand what you're doing. And when you mow a pathway through here, it, it, does, it does make it look managed. Um, and also there's all sorts of signs and indicators you can do in community spaces. Obviously, you probably wouldn't put this in your own garden because you know full well what you're doing. Um, but there's lots of signs like this popping up where um, communities are taking um, control of local spaces um, and choosing to manage it differently. I live in Farnham, actually, and just around by the Lidl, um, there's sort of surrounding it, it always used to just be grass and bare space and it's been taken over by the community and it's been planted for pollinators and it looks fantastic pretty much all year round. I've been really impressed with what they've done there. Uh, and it certainly brightens the journey up when I'm sat in my car trying to get through the central town traffic, which of course is always a joy. So what does everyone go on about bees? Somebody asked me this question the other day and they just put it so hilariously that I was like, great, so it's gonna be part of my talk. And so bee fact time, um, there's about 270 species of bee in the UK. And I was blown away when I saw that figure. It's just absolutely huge. You sort of go, how on earth in evolutionary terms does that happen that we have all these different types of bees? We've got 24 species of bumblebee, uh, and of course those of you that are sort of particularly into um, insects and pollinators, you'll see um, the FSC um, ID sheets where you've got all the different bees on there and you've got the buff-tailed bumblebee, etc, which is great. This fact I just thought was brilliant. So their feet smell, um, which is really handy. So basically they've got um, chemicals that come out of their little tiny feet. So when they um, hop onto a plant and they're gathering the pollen, uh, et cetera, um, 
another bee that comes along can tell that a bee from that colony has already been there. So it will miss that flower out and then it will go on to something that hasn't had pollen gathered from it. I just think that's absolutely amazing. And chemo reception in, in all areas of um, ecology is, is key. I mean, it happens in limpets and all sorts of other things, which I won't go into now. So about 90% of our wild plants depend on pollination. That, that's a huge figure. And about 75% of that is crop. So if bees and the pollinators aren't here, we're, we're going to have issues with our food supply um, and all sorts of other things. And I think people struggle to make that link. They, they don't see the connection between um, A, wildlife in general, but B, pollinators to what we're actually doing and what we need as human beings. If farmers were going to artificially pollinate, so if all the pollinators are gone, it would have, I mean, somebody's come up with this figure and I, I can't tell you that it's absolutely accurate, but it certainly came from a, a reputable source. It would cost them about 1.8 billion pounds a year to actually pollinate crops for us to then go on and eat. But bees need a transport system to get around. You know, they can't fly for miles and miles and miles um, with no sort of way to gather nectar and all of that kind of stuff. So interestingly, I attended, and some of you may have been on this as well, um, a launch by Bug Life of their bee lines. So this is an extraordinary project. They have spent about 10 years um, mapping three kilometre corridors um, across the whole of the UK. These three kilometre corridors are specifically mapped to try and connect habitats together. So they're not just random lines, they're looking at all of the surrounding areas. Um, you know, they're looking at the Thames Basin heaths, they're looking at um, the green sands and all of that kind of stuff and then working out what bits are missing and what will pollinators need to actually move from one space to another. They've worked with all sorts of organisations, they've worked with organisations such as ourselves, they've worked with district and borough councils, they've worked with other landowners and I can't remember exactly when the presentation was but probably about a month ago, between one and two months ago, they launched this map um, and then you can see we've got these bee lines in the, the bottom left um, right hand corner, um, which is specific to Surrey and all of the boroughs that we have um, got. And one of the bits of my job that I'm undertaking at the moment is I'm working well, I'm connecting with councils around, I'm going to call it all things pollinators. So, for example, that includes conversations around pesticide use. It, it contains conversations around bee lines and how those connect between the areas that they manage. It's around road verges and looking at whether changes realistically can be made in certain areas that will make a difference. It's, it's talking about quite big stuff like green infrastructure and talking to Woking and Surrey County Council about the concept of, you know, greening up urban spaces and green bus stops and all sorts of things that effectively create what we're almost calling pollinator pit stops um, that re-green areas that have just become sort of grey gray wastelands. So th this is going to be key going forward. It's um, a lot of organisations are interested in this. I particularly am and um, it's it's got the interest more importantly of the councils which is which is a good thing. So this is the image here of how bees would actually make their way through this um, through this corridor or highway. But it's not just about bees. Uh, there's lots of other things actually um, that also love pollen and create and and sort of undertake pollination um, that people don't necessarily realise. So we've got ladybirds here. Obviously they love aphids, so they're our friend in many ways. <laughs> 
Um, but they also love pollen, um, and there's lots of there's lots of different plants they particularly enjoy. And the pictures here, as most of you will know, um, are of cosmos and marigolds. But they also love plants like dill, angelica, and calendula, and all of that kind of stuff. So again, you know, not not just the aphid munching uh, creatures that we all think of them about. We've also got beautiful lace wings. Um, again, they're a ferocious, absolutely ferocious aphid eater. So again, uh, a gardener's friend. Often if you've got uh, certainly roses, I've got a lot of aphids on my roses at the moment. Um, but they, all, they also enjoy pollen and honeydew and in turn um, play their own part in ongoing pollination as they move from plant to plant. We've got hoverflies, um, quite often mistaken, obviously, for other flying insects and wasps and things like that, but um, yeah, hoverflies indeed. And you've guessed it, they eat aphids, <laughs> so that's helpful. Um, but they also do eat caterpillars and thrips. Uh, mixed views on those, I suppose, because caterpillars eventually will, will turn into to butterflies. Um, but again, they they love nectar, and again, they really like dahlias um, and Michaelmas daisies and Achilleas and all of that kind of stuff. So you can imagine your own gardens and the plants that you've got living there, not necessarily in your lawn, but in your flower beds. Um, and you can see how it all adds up. I mean, these aren't really pollinators, but they are a key part of our kind of insect range within gardens. So I just I just put spiders in because sometimes they get a poor press and um, I just felt they should be acknowledged on some level. And I really like the pictures as well. I think these are excellent. Some of these and um, some of our own staff have taken. So it's amazing. Soldier beetles, uh, these are brilliant. Uh, you should be seeing these around and about at the moment. And often, often some of them can be quite bright red. They're literally killing machines. So they are all over slugs and snails, which um, would fill me with joy if I had an enormous amount circling around my courgettes at the moment. Um, and of course they love aphids, but they also like pollen from particular species as well. So catnip, um, which is the, the purple plant on the bottom left, um, and hydrangea, believe it or not. I mean, some of these some of these plants that are coming through for some of these insects quite surprised me because um, I did do some research for the bits that I, I wasn't as a fay with for the, for, the, for the purposes of this talk. So back to Nomo May, which is what this is about. So we took a slight diversion there and um, or, or just around about insects in our garden, but what has it actually achieved? I mean, from my opinion, I think data, absolutely lots and lots and lots of data for those that are willing to submit it. And habitat, lots and lots of habitat that wasn't there before because we were mowing our lawns. So these figures I'm about to run through, these, these have come from plant life and they've, they, they, are, they are directly linked to all the data that people have submitted through the surveys that they've done. So leaving lawns uncut for one month, um, so May, the month of May, leapt from 15% in 2019 to 36% in 2020. And I think, you know, I think there are reasons for this. One, they were the second year into a campaign around May, 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 so it got slightly more airtime. Um, and two, we were in the middle of a pandemic and people were thinking about things differently and some people had more time to give um, to their gardens. Leaving lawns uncut for a whole year, I mean, that's brave. That's brave. <laughs> Um, doubled from 10% in 2019 to 21% in 2020. Now, um, could I do that myself? I don't know. Um, it's It would be harder for me to do that in my garden, but I think I would ha be happy to leave it uncut for a month and then see what happens. Cutting lawns weekly or, or fortnightly, so however those... Um, those numbers work out, dropped from 47% in 2019 to 16% in 2020. Now that is a huge drop. 
um, and linked to many things. I mean, a lot of organisations are talking about um, no may may plus other concepts. You know, it's all over Gardner's world. Um, Radio 2 have literally just launched um, a B campaign this week with all sorts of celebrities promoting it and comedians, etc. Zoe Ball um, seems to be sort of heading that up. So things are getting a lot of airtime. So I started digging around because I was like, I think we need to understand exactly what's coming through from plant life. So these are the figures and stats from 2019. So in, in total, um, just shy of 500,000 individual flowers were counted and about 203 different species were found. And I mean, that's just extraordinary. And this is just in lawn. So this is the every flower count survey results. So people haven't made their lawn and then they've done a quadrat. So they've, they've done a one meter by one meter squared quad, quadrat in their garden and then counted what's come through. This is what these results are. So you can see that daisies, <laughs> daisies as, as you'd probably expect, um, were certainly the front runner here by far, by, by a million miles, really. Um, but then you've got lots of other cool stuff coming through. You've got the white clavers, you've got the self heal, which sometimes I always confuse with bugle and I have to remember the different habitats and, and where they're found, etc. I'm not a plant expert. I'm quite new to all of this kind of stuff. So, so learning, learning with the rest of the uh, the plant life troop. Birds for trefoil, brilliant. Absolutely loved the fact that that was coming through in lawns. Jamanda speedwell, lovely plant. I did get it in my lawn, and I was very happy to see that come through. Creeping buttercup and dandelion. So these these were the sort of top runners really, and they didn't go into more detail for, for the lower down species. So interestingly, they, they also did some analysis around who produces the most nectar. And you can see here that Daisy is actually fourth. And the front runner is the white claver. And actually, when I think about it, and I think back to my lawn and, and observing what's flying around and where they're going to, they do favour the white clovers um, that are there. Dandelion, obviously key, you know, there's been a big campaign about people not digging them out and leaving them for longer and all of that kind of stuff. And I've made a real effort to do that this year. Um, and I think that's worked well. Um, we've got red clover in here as well, which um, I, I was just really surprised when I looked at it, the difference between the white clover and the red clover and the amount of nectar that they produce. You sort of think, why are they so different? So my next plan is to, to look into that and see what's what. Um, and towards the bottom, you've got the oxide daisies um, and the cat's ear and hawk bit, much less, um, which is a shame actually, because the, certainly with the oxide daisies, those are the sorts of things that you can see, you know, coming through in spades on the A31, etc. But that's not to say they don't play a role. It's just, for me, it was very surprising to see how the levels were so different between all of these different flowers. So in 2020, um, the top lawn flowers were quite different. Um, so you've got a couple of other things coming into here. Um, and sorry, my eyes are just, yeah. So they actually tracked the, the cat's ear and the hawk bits, meadow buttercup instead of um, creeping butterfly, buttercup, sorry. And field forget-me-not, which was new, um, which is brilliant. And I'm not quite sure what changes some of these things in lawns from one year to the next. The survey results are quite different um, for 2020 and I'll come on to some other slides that are quite interesting because last year the May was the driest for 123 years. I mean we started getting exceptional weather and I remember it quite clearly from April and it was super hot and super dry and obviously that's bound to have um, an effect on things. So, oh no, this header is in my way, so I can't read the top of the slide. Um, Sophie, are you there? It 
it's fine, don't worry. You'll be able to read the slide. What I can't do because the headline um, of Zoom is in the way of my title here, um, shows you uh, the reduction in flowers, but actually the ongoing effect was there was only a 2% reduction in nectar, which is very interesting. We'll come on to, to why that happened. So in 2020, they saw a massive decline in dandelions, 56% decline in the amount of dandelion data that was coming through. Daisies were down 40%, the Germanda Speedwell down 36%, and the Bird's Foot Treffle again down, not quite as dramatically. But this was all linked to the fact that we had a severe drought and it hit some of these species really hard. So they're not as resistant as we'd like them to be to conditions that we might see more um, in future years. It's just impossible to know. Oh, now my screen is through. There we go. Um, but why did the nectar count not reduce so much? Well, on the flip side, we ended up with an even more species of, of, of other things. So although, you know, dandelions were down, we had about 2.2 times more cat's ear and hawk bit, and the white clover exploded and oxide daisy came into its own and we had more red clover. So, and they all flowered early. So because the weather was so warm, they were coming through at different times, which meant that the nectar level remained fairly steady. But then it took a hit later on in the year, probably around July time, um, because all of the species had flowered early. So you can just see how everything is just inextricably linked and how cause and effect really works with this. So for 2020, uh, we've got a national nectar score. Uh, so you can see that on the slide, the nectar production was down in May and July during the drought. So the overall nectar score fell by 7%. I mean, it's not absolutely catastrophic, but if you think about it in the entirety of the UK, the number's probably um, higher than we'd want it to be. And you can see that actually when you equate that to nectar sugar and the things that are available for bees and other pollinators, actually that does create quite a dramatic um, impact on them as a population. So this is my back garden, right, in a slightly elongated, slightly skewed picture where I was trying to get it to fit the slide. You can see in the top right hand corner my Surrey Wildlife Trust fan, <laughs> uh, trustily parks there. So when I did May May May, I thought people, although I did my blog and sort of various other things online, um, might be interested in what, what I found there. Um, so I got through daisies, and I got through dandelions, and I got through little violets, um, which were quite nice. I got the start of um, ragwort coming through, got quite a bit of that actually. Um, I got the hawk bits, I got the Germanda speedwell, and I got the start of um, clover leaves, particularly in the areas that were slightly wetter or indeed slightly more shaded. So my garden is south facing. Um, and the top bit is always quite dry and arid, but down near the apple trees at the back, you can see it's always um, a bit better down there. So the big question is, did I end up living in a big waving wild flower meadow through doing no May May? And in short, the answer to that is no. And th there were sort of elements of that that I was a bit disappointed about. I sort of had these visions of me going, look at how, you know, like that picture that I was showing you with the, the pathway main through, and that's what I was assuming I'd end up with. Um, but naively, I didn't. Um, but I think that that was for quite a few reasons. Um, one is I have made my lawn um, religiously year after year. So, you know, that is going to take time to recover and change. May this year was really cold and it felt like it would never stop raining. And uh, I was trying to look for the rain stats, actually, but it all just got a bit complicated and I felt it didn't necessarily add to, to this presentation. But those those will that will have undoubtedly impacted growth. So conversely to last year, things will have been growing more slowly. So I mean, I did get new flowers in my lawn, 
I just didn't get them in quite the abundance that I thought I would. And there were definitely less pollinators clearly put off by the weather, um, the rain and indeed the temperatures. I mean, butterflies need, you know, 12 to 14 degrees to be present before they can even fly. And they're certainly not going to do that in the pouring rain. So the scores from plant life in 2021 will be fascinating. They won't come out until um, after July because they do a July count as well so that they can get a bit of a seasonal shift. Um, so it'll be nice to see what comes through on that. But I think uh, although, you know, I was slightly underwhelmed with what came through in my garden, it, that doesn't mean that I won't change my mowing regime going forward because I could see the benefit. So there's plenty, not within your lawn, but there's plenty to plant all year round for nectar. So if you're interested in increasing pollinators in your general garden, um, you know, most of you who are on here, I'm sure, are keen and avid gardeners and, and know most of this. But, you know, for all year round nectar, spring, you've got um, wild primroses and grape hyacinths. Summer, there's the obvious plants, you know, you've got catnip, you've got lavender you've got hollyhocks um i've put in the erysium bowls mauve actually it's uh, one of my favorites actually and it seems to last forever and the pollinators do seem to really quite like it and in autumn um you know dahlias uh you've got the the mallow at the bottom there um actually that dahlia picture probably isn't ideal the more complex flowers um aren't great for pollinators because they can't actually get to the the pollen within there the winter, people think, oh, there's nothing in winter at all, there's nothing we can do. But, you know, so many of these bulb species, you've got the winter aconites at the bottom. And actually, I've got a whole area underneath the fruit trees that weren't planted by me, actually, it was the previous owner, which is full of winter aconites that come through. You've got snowdrops, you've got crocus and all sorts of things. And I've popped a link on here um, that you can go to where you can look at what plants to plant for pollinators. I mean, RHS have got information galore on their website. So there's plenty, there's plenty around and garden as well, as well, and things like that. I mean, these, I, I put this in because we have a lot of conversations around non-natives and what we can plant and what we can't, etc. And there's a difference between non-native and an invasive species, I think. Um, non-natives aren't necessarily awful if you're looking at planting them in your own garden and sometimes they can help you to extend your nectar period from certainly um, into the later summer the the sort of August September time but you do need to know what you're planting and I'm sure none of you are going to plant this because most of these don't flower apart from the Himalayan balsam and the, the sort of braided engine etc but obviously there are some plants that are covered by legislation um, which I've named at the top here <laughs> yeah. Um, and have to be controlled. Um, and so the people say to me, oh, what, what, what's, what's, what's the problem with Himalayan balsam? You know, it looks quite pretty, it's this and that. And actually that's, that's indeed why it was brought over here by the Victorians. Um, and it does, you know, have nice flower on it, etc. But it, the problem with it is it dominates and it takes over and it grows really quickly and fast and it just smothers any other smaller UK native species that would come through. Um, so got obviously no chance of growing, so therefore they don't. And it just, it affects our native populations. And then we've got others um, like the Spanish bluebell, which hybridise with the UK species and therefore you're losing um, something that's native and quite often they compete for resources etc. There's loads of um, information if you're more interested in invasive uh, species, non native species and in particular the wildlife law etc um, which I wasn't going to um, go into more detail on that but just have a think about what you're planting. There's been a bit of a hoo-ha recently around some of the aquatic species that are sold in, in some garden centres um, that actually sort of have been renamed, but actually are the invasive species, etc. So it's just worth doing a bit of research on that. And that is the totality of the slides and talk today. So 